Glad to see you could join us for this 4K Join the Technician subscriber special. In this episode, I'm going to show you how you can build your own plasma pen from scratch and show you all the crazy stuff these things can do. So hang around for the eye candy and learn from the tutorial in this episode. It's like a whole other world. It's like Alice in Wonderland. Like things literally just shift and warp. <laughs> I'm gonna run some uh, footage to the uh, camera. <laughs> That's so cool. Put them on. Just, just like. <laughs> Patrick's polarizer glasses may just get a video of their own. You know, we try to only bring you the coolest gadgets on this channel, and this one here is no exception. So, what exactly is this plasma pen? Well, it's a powerful handheld high frequency electric device that can produce a small flame of plasma at its output electrode. Normally, something like this would require an external power source connected to the pen with a cable, but you can get a lot more energy out of a battery than most people expect, up to 25 watts in this case. This beast effortlessly obliterates all kinds of unexpected things and is just an absolute blast to operate. But before I teach you how to build it, let's watch a montage of destruction and experimentation showing off just what it can do. A metalized foil bag doesn't stand the chance. These plasma pens are awesome at wood burning, allowing the creation of a fine burned line up to two inches long. The only downside is the fairly short battery life of just a few minutes, but the good thing is they charge fast, so that's not a problem. Adding a second plasma pen to the mix increases the precision and control and allows for longer arcs to be drawn. One of the coolest things about plasma is how hot it actually is. Here we can see it melting thin tungsten wire. Of course you can light an LED, but if that seems boring to you, you can also try lighting an LED on fire. If you look closely, you can see the ion wind produced by the plasma pen moving the flame around. Don't use your plasma pens to solder. You can't say we're not wizards. Xenon was one of the craziest gases to mess with. We were both totally enamored on how the arcs move around inside these tubes. The motion of the Xenon arc is caused by the high frequency AC generated by the pens. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah. Wow. You can also use the plasma pens for curly and photography, thanks to their ability to generate plenty of corona under small conductive objects. Damn, that's cool. Just pulls it right in, huh? When the voltage is high enough, the alternating current field attracts lightweight things like this hanging ribbon of videotape. No doubt these little gadgets are champions at lighting up cold cathode fluorescent lamps. After all, that is the original application their transformers were designed for. And at these power levels, it's pretty surprising to see just how many tubes they can drive at once. It's 
It's even got the power to ignite a full-length 8-foot fluorescent bulb. Just ridiculous. Of course, it's not lit to full brightness, but who cares? Look at this thing. God, these things are fantastic. This runtime is insane, though. I can't believe that thing can sit there and maintain that kind of power output. That's... It's pretty impressive, really. And of course, we wouldn't have these plasma pens if Patrick hadn't come up with the design first. So let's hear what he has to say. I'm always pursuing a more complex, better version of something. I want to see what can be possible. I love the miniaturization of things, small watches and small other gizmos and stuff. It pushes what we know as a species. And uh, this pushes what I can do, my personal talents. And these are the plasma pens. The first one that I built, plasma pen version one, was awesome. And I built this because the no. Tesla marker that I built originally just wasn't good enough, which led to the development of plasma pen version two after Jeremiah built his. Um, it's hard to be outdone, but sometimes you need a nemesis to get there and motivate you, which led to the awesome power in your hand to light up a light bulb and shock yourself while doing it. <laughs> awesome. I want to give a huge thank you to all 4,000 of you who have subscribed to our growing channel. We love sharing the most innovatively magical projects we can think of with you. Many of you have suggested that we start selling kits, and we'd love to do that. Your support will help make it happen faster. When you choose to donate a few dollars to our channel through PayPal, you provide the equipment and resources needed to create more frequent content and start putting together the project kits you've been asking for. Please invest in us so that we can invest back in you. Definitely, donations do help. We need new wire, we need better transformers, better parts, and of course all the information that we learn will be given to you. Uh, we want to teach the world. We want to see people succeed and see people find curiosity and interest in things that they never thought were possible. And that's what this Join the Technician channel is all about. And that's amazing. They allow us to explore what electricity does. It's so different. Like you can see the curvature of the fields with that one as you draw it by. We've never seen anything this small or powerful for sale anywhere, so if you want one, you'll have to build it yourself. The tutorial you're about to see is extremely detailed because we've included the most vital information to help you succeed. Even if you feel unsure about your abilities, don't let it discourage you. I want to encourage you to learn everything you can from this video. We failed several times before we finally got this design working perfectly, and now you're about to learn how to do it yourself. If you like what you've seen and you want your own plasma pen, here's how you can build one. Everything goes on this small circuit board that I'll show you how to make later on. Then you need a power switch, an LED, two low on resistance MOSFETs that are good for at least 10 amps, two high speed diodes, these are 1N4148s, and then a set of capacitors or a single capacitor that's roughly around 1 microfarad, and finally four fixed resistors between 200 and 400 ohms, they can all be the same value. All these components work to power this CCFL transformer, which is connected to a high voltage output electrode like this one. Then to power the circuit, a small lithium ion or lithium polymer battery works well. We also need an inductor, an optional battery charging circuit, and something to mount the battery charging port inside. In this case, we'll just use the can of a capacitor. To build the plasma pen, you're going to want to start out with a laptop display. You want one of the older ones that's not LED, and when you take it apart, on the bottom strip here, you're going to find a small board like this. Now, these are designed for driving cold cathode fluorescent lamps, and these little transformers on here are the part that you want to focus on. So let's start by removing this one from the board. These transformers can't be used exactly as they are because they're not insulated well enough, and the primary coil does not have the correct number of turns for a plasma pen. So the first thing we have to do is remove the tape from the secondary and the primary coil. And I have to emphasize you need to be extremely careful with the secondary because that wire is very very thin and hard to see. So all it takes is one nick and you will destroy your coil. There are two methods to remove the tape from these coils. You can either use a sharp razor blade or you can take apart the core. First I'll show you how to use a blade and a pair of pliers. Sometimes you can remove the old primary by unwinding it, but in this case it's Litz wire and it's got varnish all over it so I'm just going to slice it right off with the blade. However, it's a lot safer and easier just to take the core apart. Use a heat gun on the low heat setting until the epoxy becomes soft enough to peel away. Then, you can slowly work the two halves of the core apart. Alright, now while this core is hot still, I want to clean off all this junk, the old epoxy that was holding it together. Just use your fingernails to unwrap the tape, but be careful on the last turn as you don't want to touch the secondary coil. Then just cut the wire and unwind the primary.
The primary coil can be made of anything as thin as 22 gauge and as thick as 16 gauge. I prefer to use multi-stranded litz wire like this stuff, which if you don't have your own litz wire you can always make some. I've got a reel of 36 gauge wire here and I'm just going to use this one foot long ruler that's plastic and flexible, which is going to make this really easy. So here we go. Alright, so that's only 10 times back and forth, and that will be plenty. So now all we have to do to release it is just flex the ruler, take it off the side, and pull all these things into one strand. I like to use a power drill to twist these up, but you can also do it by hand, which I'll show you now. And there we go, just enough litz wire for one transformer. Before winding with the litz wire we just made, it's going to help to tin the ends. That should work just fine. That's one primary turn, two, three. Okay, so now I'm at three, and what I'm going to do is make a fold in the middle of this primary coil, bring out some distance and fold it back on itself. This is what we call a center tap. And once again, one, two, got to make sure those windings stay nice and tight, and on three, now I'm going to bring that down, and that's the final turn. A little more super glue will help keep it in place. And using the litz wire we just made, we'll begin to wind the transformer. So the soldered or prepared end we want to always send through the core, which means we want to start by pulling that through all the way and then preparing our unsoldered end this way. So now I'm going to bring this wire out, fold it in half, and then continue winding. I'm just going to bring it back out here. So now we have a center tapped primary with two and a half turns plus two and a half turns. And our center tap is right here. And the last thing to do before epoxy coating would be to put a little super glue back on the core and put it back together. Now of course you could use the epoxy to hold this piece of the core down but there's a chance that it wouldn't be very tight and this needs to be back exactly where it started in order to close the magnetic path for the transformer to work. The last thing to do is to coat your secondary and primary before you continue. These have to be very well insulated and for this I would recommend epoxy. When mixing epoxy, I like to use a small bag because it allows me to precisely mix everything and not make a mess. Once the epoxy is thoroughly mixed, cut a small slice in the corner and you can begin to apply. Start with the area that's going to take the longest for the epoxy to flow into. This is a really good sign, I want to point this out, because we can see that the epoxy is coming through the other side of the core, which tells us we have a full coverage between the wire and the ferrite itself. It's very important to make sure that there is no bubbles between these coils and the ferrite core, otherwise it will certainly arc. And now for those to cure. Once the epoxy is fully cured, it should be pretty easy to remove the transformers. Even if they're stuck, that's okay, you can always just cut them out with the scissors and remove the rest of the material. Okay, that looks really good. For the case and the battery, I ended up using an electronic cigarette, which are pretty commonly available here in the US. Avoid electronic cigarettes with stainless steel cases like this one. Try to find plastic cases like this, this, or this. This happens to have nicotine in it, which we don't want to get on our hands. So for this, I'm just going to use a wooden rod to push everything out one side. And then I'll go ahead and remove the parts that we don't need. All we really want is the battery. 
Then rinse the plastic tube out with some water and wipe out the inside making sure that you get all the vape juice out. Excellent. To make the circuit board you can use pretty much any piece of double sided blank circuit board material that fits inside the tube you want to use. We'll only need about an inch of this. I want to see the maximum number of you succeed so I've optimized the board design so it can be made with basic tools. These arrows show where a wire will need to be fed through each small hole and soldered to electrically connect both sides of the board. The same thing needs to be done here as well. Through board connections are called vias and we're just using a wire to make them in this case. I don't show this step in the video but it's important to do this first. I'm just going to cut this board out with a file. These two notches I'm piling into the side of the board will make space for the diodes later on. I'd highly recommend using some tinning flux and solder to prepare all your connections. This makes everything so much easier to put together. Once that's done, you can start soldering your parts on the board. I recommend starting with the MOSFETs. These two MOSFETs are salvaged from Xbox motherboards. They can handle 62 amps at 25 volts, while being under 8.4 milliohms. Of course, you don't need MOSFETs this powerful. Anything with at least a 10 amp rating at under 10 milliohms will work. These diodes are 1N4148s. They can be any high speed diode that's good for at least 25 volts at at least 300 milliamps. The first diode goes here. It connects the gate of the back MOSFET to the drain of the front MOSFET. The second diode goes here. It's a little hard to see, but I'm fitting these diodes right into the notches cut into the circuit board. Each diode connects the gate of the MOSFET on one side to the drain of the MOSFET on the other. I couldn't get a clear shot demonstrating the rest of the components being put on the board, so I've just assembled everything else off camera. You can refer to the diagram to see where everything goes. Here's how the rest of the components go on the board. These two are the pull-up resistors for the MOSFET gates. Here's the discharge resistor for the MOSFET gates. This last resistor drops voltage for the LED. Here's where the switch goes. These four non-polarized capacitors all get wired in series, which requires the use of a jumper between the two sides of the board. Here are the remaining connections in case there is any confusion, and here's the power wire connections and transformer wiring. Now the circuit operates pretty well with a wide range of component values, but I wanted to get better tuning out of it, so I ended up swapping out two of these capacitors, reducing my total capacitance from 1.25 microfarads down to 0.93 microfarads, which is closer to my transformer's ideal frequency, giving me higher output. And before attaching the transformer, we're going to want to add some heat sinks to these MOSFETs, which isn't always necessary, but is always a good idea. My heat sinks are just bent over pieces of brass strip, and I'm going to solder those straight to the drain tab of each MOSFET. Now is also the perfect time to attach the power wires. The negative power wire can be soldered directly to the source tab of either MOSFET since both source tabs are connected. This short red piece of wire connects the battery's positive terminal to the positive input of the board. Off camera, I've taken some time to prepare my transformer. I isolated the ground of the secondary coil and attached it to this wire. It's not necessary to do this, but I wanted to do it for experimentation later on. I've also sliced down the two ends of my primary coil and added extension wires to both ends, and I've tinned the center tap and attached it to an inductor that I wound earlier. At this point we're ready to attach this transformer and inductor to our driving circuit board. The inductor is electrically connected to the same pad the positive wire goes to. Then the two transformers primary wires go to the drain tabs of each MOSFET, same place the heat sinks are connected to. At this point it would be the best idea to connect it to a power supply and test it, but I'm pretty confident I got it right, so I'm just going to wire it straight to the battery. Since the battery's positive terminal is closest to the board, we'll start with that wire. Using tape or other insulating materials to prevent parts from pressing together that might short once it's inserted into the tube is a very wise idea. Before sliding the whole thing into the tube, I've also connected the negative power wire, but it's a better idea to connect the negative power wire after the circuit's in the housing so you're not working with it live. This piece of copper tape has a hole cut in the back so we can still see the LED illuminate when the system is on. It serves to connect the transformer's ground terminal to the operator so that a single wire output plasma can be achieved. 
Here I've just tucked the wire directly underneath that piece of copper and then I'm going to use a small tool to press the copper down tightly against the case. To house the charging port, I'm just going to use the case of a capacitor that's slightly wider than the tube. Using a vise will definitely make it easier to cut the porthole in this capacitor case. This red connector is what needs to pass through that hole. So I'll just be using a hand file until I can make it large enough to pass the connector. Alright, there we go. And now that can just fit through. Perfect. All that needs to happen now are these two wires need to be stripped back, tinned, and connected to the cable connector before they're inserted into the end cap. Double check to make sure the port lines up with the hole that you made earlier before gluing it in place. Then some gel super glue can be used to keep the connector against the inside of the aluminum can. Also coat those solder connections with some super glue to keep them from shorting out against the inside of the aluminum can. Apply a bead of adhesive around the outside of the tube and push the end cap into place. And finally it's time to test our creation. Let's see if it will melt some thin magnet wire. Is this considered mistreatment of an orange? It smells like citrus. Ooh, critical hit. Coffee, creamer. Probably not the best way to mix, but it's, uh, it's definitely an interesting way. Oh, I didn't expect that to happen. <laughs> It smells like marshmallows, honestly, but I really don't want to drink that. <laughs> nah! I feel like a cheap motel light, man. <laughs> no, oh, we gotta do this. Plasma pens with your friends. Gotta collect them all, man. Don't worry about being discouraged because here we have a synonym for failure and we call it learning. And it's something that engineers and technicians do every day all around the world. Did you like the video? Did you learn something? If you want to see more of your friends getting motivated by projects like this, send them this video. And if you want to see more content like this from our channel, don't forget to subscribe and turn on your notifications to see when we produce new content. And hey, if you have questions about the projects we post, you can contact me or Patrick directly or any of the other technicians on our Join the Technicians Facebook page. You can find links to all those things in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and we'll catch you in the next video.